girls are left alone in a cabin in the woods for five years, and upon rediscovery find themselves under the care of their uncle and his punk rock girlfriend. However, it seems the girls have brought along a supernatural entity known as Mama, who takes mothering to an insane level and will do anything, or kill anyone, to keep these children for herself. I'll admit, that's a pretty interesting concept for a horror film, taking the concept of strong maternal instincts and turning them into a purely destructive force. It's too bad that, while having some decent creepy atmosphere and mostly good performances, the film is really poor storytelling. The movie spends way too much time overcomplicating its plot when it doesn't really need to. For example, the reason the two girls end up in the cabin where Mama lives in the first place is because their father, played by Nikolai Koster Waldu, murders his business partners and wife for some reason, drives his daughters into the woods for some reason, crashes their car, and finds the cabin randomly. Which all sounds like important plot stuff, but outside getting the girls to the cabin, it really has nothing to do with anything. You could have just have had the family going on a trip, they crash, the parents are killed, and the kids wander the woods until they find the cabin. That's pretty much the film's entire philosophy. Whenever possible, make things as meaninglessly complicated as possible. The main source of horror in this film is almost entirely a metaphor of mothering, and this is one of those times that the horror film antagonist doesn't really need a backstory, It doesn't really need a psychiatrist digging through old public archives, doesn't really need weird flashbacks. And much like the whole father murders a bunch of people thread, none of it actually means anything to the film beyond offering a possible way to stop Mama, which, spoiler warning, doesn't actually work. Mama is much more scary and effective as an unstoppable force than she is as an actual person with understandable character motivations. And the way the film goes about presenting all this information is just all over the map. We follow one character's investigation and discover things through their eyes, only for that character to be killed. Then another character starts their own investigation from scratch, and while they'll go about it in a different manner, it's still all information the audience already knows. That's just poor structure. Things like unexplained visions and hospital escapes lead to plot cul-de-sacs, when things just go nowhere and suddenly decide to not matter. It is all this leading to a climax of a film that is going to leave most people in the audience scratching their heads. Actually, the ending would have worked better if they had stuck to the metaphorical aspects of their villain instead of trying and failing to apply any kind of logical backstory to it. It's ultimately a mediocre film, but there is still a lot here to like. As I mentioned before, the acting is pretty great all around. The big name here is, of course, Jessica Chastain, if not for the film trivia of having this and Zero Dark Thirty being the top two films in the box office for a week. Still, comparing the two roles shows that Chastain has a really good range. Her transformation here into a mid-30s punk rock girl is so good that I wouldn't have realized it was her if it wasn't for all over the advertising. The film also finds the key to making child actors always work, namely by having them not talk that much and having them act like they've been raised in the woods by a monster. You know, pretty much how children naturally act. The film has a lot of really effective atmosphere, utilizing empty spaces and shadows effectively. There are minimal jump scares. This is the kind of film that is more apt to have something slither slowly out of the shadows rather than jump out. There is a touch of Tim Burton influence here, in the way certain scenes are shot, especially near the end. And the soundtrack sounds a lot like Danny Elfman, almost to a fault. I actually triple checked to make sure it actually wasn't Danny Elfman. There are a lot of good resources here for a better film than this. Mama is okay, it's not awful, but it's one of those kind of films that could have been a lot better. One of those films I wish I could do a script rewrite for to tighten its focus. If you're a horror fan, it's probably worth checking out. This is one of the first horror films I've seen since starting all the movies that got a genuine frightened reaction from the audience. For the more casual film goers, this is more of a rental. The reason I review films a week after they've been released, as opposed to as soon as I see them, is to give myself time to mull it over. It's not uncommon for me to like or dislike a film right out of the theater, only to gradually change my mind the more I think about it. For example, my initial thoughts of Mama were actually more positive for the first few hours after I'd seen it, only for that to break down the more I contemplated it. I find long-term opinions more valid. 
However, this idea may have backfired here, because with every passing day, I forget more and more about The Last Stand. This film is pretty much about bringing Arnold Schwarzenegger back to action films once his political career ended. It's a check mark on a piece of paper, a future trivial pursuit question. The film has very little in terms of style, decent action, witty one-liners, or anything else often associated with loud, explody action films from the 80s, for which Hollywood seems to be having a huge nostalgic kick for lately. We still have guys like Sylvester Stallone and Bruce Willis headlining major action films, and it's really starting to feel weird. I'm not saying old people can't kick ass, Charles Bronson was old his entire life, but trying to ride these older actors on the popularity of their previous works alone just seems a bit... I don't know, evil. And really, Arnold seems to have gotten the oldest and slowed down the most out of all of these old 80s action stars. Best case scenario is that he's incredibly rusty. The last time he really did this kind of thing was 10 years ago with Terminator 3. Worst case scenario, he's just lost it. Let's be clear, Arnold was never a great actor, but he's been a charismatic actor that draws people in with raw Austrian swagger. Here, he's too slow and stiff for the action stuff. He can't even seem to shoot a mounted Gatling gun anymore without seeming awkward. There's a lot of CGI painting over the action, lots of fake computer-generated blood, and green screen shots to cover up the fact that it, this is a dumpy 65-year-old man. Arnold can't even seem to pull off one-liners anymore. He always just comes off tired rather than cool. You could argue that's the point, but even if I took that excuse for the action scenes, it's clear that they're still attempting to cash in on one-liners like the good old days. They're just failing miserably. When Louis Guzman is looking more like a viable action star in your movie than Arnold Schwarzenegger, then you have to step back and really ask yourselves if this is the movie you really wanted to make. So, um... Things happen in this movie. A uh, bad guy escapes prison, he spends most of the movie driving to the American-Mexican border in a car commercial, he gives some kind of Joker-esque scar story thing, he crashes his car and gets into a Greco-Roman wrestling match with Arnold on a green screen bridge. Most of the movie is Arnold the Sheriff dealing with the bad guy's henchmen, led by Peter Stormar, the, uh, you know, the unpimp Zialto guy. Johnny Knoxville is in it, he doesn't really do much, and isn't that annoying. Frankly, Small and Forgettable is the exact opposite of what this movie should have been. Tis better for an 80s throwback action film to burn out in a blaze of suck than to fade away into the white noise of $5 Walmart DVDs. I would recommend or not recommend this movie, but I can't remember it. I guess this week's running theme is meh. But for what it's worth, Broken City is the least meh this week. It stars Mark Wahlberg as a cop who has an incident, which causes him to leave the force and become a private detective. He ends up getting hired by the mayor of New York City, played by Russell Crowe, to track his wife under the pretense that she's having an affair behind his back. Wahlberg brings back some photos, but when the man in the photos ends up dead, he finds himself knee-deep in a conspiracy revolving around morally suspect construction plans and the upcoming election of mayor. Much like Mama, this is a film with really solid acting and a decent sense of direction, but flounders a bit in the script department. For one, this is the kind of film that tries to play up plot twists and mystery, but is so not subtle when it comes to dropping clues. You could have had sirens blaring and text popping up saying, this is important, and it wouldn't have been any less obvious. Which is weird, and this might sound contradictory, but stay with me. The actual conflict is incredibly technical, and I imagine a lot of people might have a hard time following it. We're talking lots of tracking down paperwork, lots of backhand deals and political jargon. It's actually not that complicated. Russell Crowe's evil scheme isn't too far off from breaking two electric boogaloos, they're gonna tear down the community center plot, but it's hiding beneath buzzwords and blueprints. But none of that actually matters. The mayor could be building a death ray and this would mostly be the same movie. It's really the characters that drive it forward. Mark Wahlberg has always played characters who are honest and oblivious to a fault really well, and that's pretty much his character here to a T. He's a character that tries to do the right thing and gets it horribly wrong. He's a character thrown in the middle of politics and celebrity and is clearly uncomfortable being there. Russell Crowe pretty much makes the film. He's made some interesting career choices as of late, 
and it's nice to have a more straightforward film to remind us how good he is. Jeffrey Wright, Catherine Zeta-Jones, Alana Tall, Natalie Martinez, uh, Kyle Chandler, and Barry Pepper, of all people, turn in performances ranging from solid to excellent. It's a great ensemble. It's really a matter of balance. A strong cast like this can balance out a script that is, at best, made for TV movie quality. Throw in a moody soundtrack and a few scenes with really inspired cinematography, and you got a solid film. Uh, no, don't see a uh, full price. Go see it as a matinee, but uh, I, I guess I recommend it. I know the basics of music history about the rise of the punk movement and the fall of rock and roll, but I'm not exactly invested in it. Not because it's not interesting, but because I'm too invested in a thousand other things already. Still, I imagine Ladies and Gentlemen, The Fabulous Stains is the perfect film for people who love this time in music. It's about the state of popular music in the early 80s, about the decline of 70s glam rock, the current status of punk, and predicts the rise of Riot Girl bands and MTV-era commercialism. It's directed by Lou Adler, a record producer and the producer of the Rocky Horror Picture Show and Shock Treatment. A good chunk of the cast is made up of actual musicians, including members of the Sex Pistols, The Clash, The Tubes, and Black Randy and the Metro Squad. It gained a cult following through late night cable showings and seems to be a favorite among punk and underground film fans. It's definitely an interesting artifact, one you can talk about for hours. It's just too bad that the movie is really kinda weak. The story is about a fledgling girl garage band called The Stains, played by teenage Diane Lane, Marin Cantor, and Laura Dern, who managed to get a ride on a tour bus with a washed-up old-school rock band, The Metal Corpses, and an up-and-coming punk band called The Looters. Through a number of improvisations, lucky circumstances, and a hair dye job, The Stains end up becoming much bigger than they have any right to be. It's the setup for any number of the rise and fall of a band movie, but it avoids the typical plot lines involving drugs, sex, burnouts, and selling out by not having anything actually happen. How popular and unpopular the stains are are not determined by what they do, it's determined by just how easily led the fans are, and boy, it's way too easy to get the stain fans to turn on people. The film does do a good job at presenting a place in time. The rainy East Coast towns and the shitty bars where bands are forced to play and the rise of mall culture, crappy wood-paneled hotel rooms and brick wall auditoriums certainly does a better job at this than, say, Not Fade Away, but this is just a photo of the early 80s low-level music scene, and it doesn't have a whole lot to say about it. Sometimes characters will break out into monologues about something or other, only to be partially hidden through thick accents and some rather bad sound mixing. Almost all the drama of the film revolves around Diane Lane, and she is just not up to snuff this early in her career to carry a whole movie. The level of dialogue and the attempts to make it sound naturalistic gives the film a proto-mumblecore feel to it, which only softens any attempt to actually say anything interesting. And then the film has a happy ending. It's a pretty well-known bit of trivia among fans of this movie that the studio forced this ending on the film after the original, presumably more downbeat ending, didn't respond well in test screenings. Well, it completely invalidates what came before it, and it's so tonally off that I instinctively said gag me with a spoon. The uh, screenwriter, Nancy Dowd, hated this new ending so much that she basically Alan Smithied her credit. The music isn't that good either, and I can't help but feel that was the point. Ladies and Gentlemen, The Fabulous Stains is an interesting film, no doubt, an artifact of both an era of punk music and an era of independent filmmaking, a film of its time. But it's more interesting to read up on the behind-the-scenes stuff and discuss its place in history with other film fans than it is to actually watch. Well, see you next week.